Uh, we just talked about last week, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had arranged for the burial of Jesus and carried it out. Uh, and remember, they were not alone. Uh, as uh, Luke 23, verse 55 to 56, again, talked about that the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how the body was laid. And then verse 56, and they returned and prepared spices, anointments, and that was on the Sabbath, so they rested according to the command. So there they go. So it's the Sabbath time. They, they, they were going to rest. They are going to take that day. So that would have been, for them, a Saturday. So their Sabbath starts Friday night and then goes through to Saturday night. So that's the typical, typical custom. Now, while they were resting, other people were at work. Which is kind of like, so uh, it is interesting to note that the enemy of, of Christ understood Christ's predictions about himself better than his own followers, yeah. which is kind of interesting. We come to Matthew 27, verse 62 to 63, it says the next day, so this would have been during the Sabbath, Sabbath day, that day, it says that is the day after preparation, so it makes it clear when they were supposed to be resting, this is what they're doing. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Great point. Got to pay attention to this. So they were aware of what Jesus was saying. They had paid attention. They remember what Jesus said. And so they're conducting awesome due diligence uh, actually very beneficial to us mm -hmm. that they did this it's, it's uh, pretty awesome uh, and of course they were ensuring that the people would not get deceived you know great plan awesome so they present a very practical solution Matthew 27 verse 64 and 65 says therefore and they're telling Pilate so they're talking to Pilate they're ordering him order the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and then tell the people he is risen from the dead <coughs> and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Verse 65, Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make this secure as you can. So the crux of the issue, security of the body, they, they realize that body is key to everything. Got to, got to watch the body. They got to make sure they don't steal him away. Uh, it would, as stated, it would be the problem. They, uh, as they said, if, if he was risen and they stole the body, the fraud would be worse. Okay. But these folks, in so doing, address one of the criticisms against the resurrection: the idea that the disciples stole the body. They make sure that that doesn't happen. Let's face it, the disciples are not Ocean's Eleven as a thieving crew to be able to get in there and figure out how to be, get past these guys. Because they were given Roman guards, not temple guards. There's some folks that try to suggest that it was temple guards that they had, but that's not the key. Because if you, re if you remember your gospel stories, after he's resurrected, and uh, they had they had like let it, they had fainted and everything had happened, they went to the priest first. They didn't go to Pilate. They said, we need your help before we go to Pilate to talk about this because of what happened. You know, so this, this was Pilate's crew, not the temple crew that's dealing with this. So these are Roman guards. Good choice. These were guys who were trained killers. I mean, that's what they did. The temple guard, they were temple guards. They probably, they would wear the uniforms, have some swords, and do some stuff like that. Let's face it, when they had to go get Jesus and guy, they had to get a whole rabble with them to, to join them to go get Jesus. So they were not necessarily top-notch, high echelon troops. The Roman troops, though, were. They were they were trained together, they knew how to fight together, they they knew how to defend a certain level of ground. They they even talk about when they would defend a spot, they would have a circle, and that's where they would defend, and they were very good at it. If you look at Roman history, the only time the Romans usually got beat was by other Romans or by surprise. That's how they got beat. You know, so when you're going against Roman troops, they, they, were, they were all that in a bag of chips. They, so they, they were choosing right, you know, to a very good guard. You know, so uh, they understood that if that body was stolen, their lives would be forfeit. 
Uh, and so Matthew 27, verse 66, it says, So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So they made it secure. I don't I tried to look up like how they would seal the stone. So I'm not quite sure how they did that. There's no details, but whatever it was, they would have understood what was going on. Now I'm gonna bet, dollars for donut, that this if this Roman crew showed up to do that, their lives depend on this. Guess who's moving the stone to make sure somebody's in there? That would be me. Yeah. Like, uh, like, okay, my life is on the line on this. I'm going to make sure. That, okay, guys, a couple guys. Well, yep, he's there. Yep, check it out. He's there. Roll it back. Seal it. Good to go. And they'd also want to make sure, hey, yo, they want to make sure they're at the right two. Mm -hmm. Yep, so they, they know they're at the right spot. The body's in there. It's sealed. It's secure. They understood this. So they took all the precautions, which is awesome. I'm glad they took all those precautions, but what's interesting is even after all this happened and they did that, the, the Jewish authorities still said they stole the body. <laughs> well, you protected it. You put the guard there. How can you say that? So yeah, it was a pretty lame excuse. So that's what's going on prior to everything. Now let's come to the resurrection itself. Luke 24, 1. But on the first day of the week, and of course that would be what we call Sunday, at early dawn, they, and that would be Mary Magdalene and company, the other Marys uh, that were with him, went to the tomb, taking the, the spices they had prepared. Uh, Mark adds that they were very well, of the, well, well aware of the situation that they would run into. Uh, and the labor of love might involve some, some tomb blocks, if you will. Uh, Mark 16.3, it says, and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us when, 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 from the entrance of the tomb? So they're like trying to think this through. Like, okay, we got all this stuff. Do, 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 we're heading down the trail. Oh, yeah. Who's going to open this up for us? Great idea. Great possibility. But also, you know what this tells us? The complete obliviousness to the idea that he would have risen from the dead. Yeah. It's just like, it's not even on their radar. As far as they're concerned, he's dead. And so, Luke 24, verse 2 to 3, and so they, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. The stone was rolled away. They would find out later from the testimony of the guards what had happened earlier that morning. And Matthew 28, verses 2 to 4 tells us what happened. And it said, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I just got to imagine that the Roman guards, like, sitting there, they're all, you know, probably, like, part of them were asleep, part of them were awake, because, you know, it's, it's going, it's nighttime. That's what they would do. They wouldn't all be awake all the time, but they would have some guy, you know, awake, little shifts. That's what they would be doing. So you'd imagine the show on this one. Here comes this boom, earthquake, whoa, angel, whoa! Just like, and he goes right, he doesn't, he doesn't go through them, he just pops in right there with the stone, hey guys, rolls it out and sits on it like, uh, now what are you gonna do? <laughs> and that's what he said, it says in verse three, and his appearance was like lightning. So that means it's like, imagine, Boom! Lightning! Black! Uh, it's blinding when lightning is there. And so there, that, this is that what's going on. They're blinded. His clothing is white as snow. And the fear for fear of him, the guard trembled and became like dead men. It's like, ah! <laughs> Fall over. This, they had never seen anything like this. Yeah. This angel, angel, like, ah! Oh. You know, so good old times at the guard post right there. You know, just like, ah. So that's what had happened before they got there. Luke 24, verse 4, it says, so now they're there. It's rolled away. They can't find the body. It says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. So that they were confused. of like, what's going on? And so uh, it's like, what's happening here? They Again, just not even thinking about it. Just what's going on? And it says these, all of a sudden these guys stood by them in dazzling apparel. This word for dazzling is the same thing as a lightning flash again. So it's just like 
That it is. If you have been watching lightning and stuff close to your beef, and you see the stars in your eyes afterwards, you're like, whoa, the pattern. You know, it's like that's they're it's dazzling them, it's dazzling their eyes, overwhelming their eyesight. And so, which explains their next reaction. Uh, Luke 24, verse 5, the beginning it says, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. No bravado here. You know, they're scared. It's like, ah! Again, just like the Roman guards, they're like, ah, don't hurt us. And so, uh, then these angels, which of course is what they are, then ask a wonderful question. Luke 24, 5, the second half. The men, these angels, said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Just a, just a powerful statement. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Just, yeah, and I could just picture the angels, because they've been probably waiting there. They've been waiting to ask this question all morning. Because <laughs> they knew that these, that these ladies were probably going to be coming. They're like, oh, I'm going to go, and we're going to get them. <laughs> so these guys, and they did, you know, they asked that question. And then they could, well, these ladies, now they're even more dumbfounded about this. Well, what are you talking about? The angels continued. Luke 24, verse 6 to 7, and he says, He is not here, but is risen. He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Jesus had told this to them several times. And they're like, remember that. The word for remember means recall to your mind. We, part of it almost sounds like the word memory. You know, the Greek word sounds like memory almost. This is a pretty similar. But call to my mind. And I can just imagine. Just imagine they're in shock. They've been dazzled. Everything's going on. And he says, remember what he said. And I can just imagine suddenly the memories of all that flooding into their mind. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what he said. That this is, whoa, this is awesome. And so uh, it says in Luke 24, 8 and 9, it says, And they remembered his words, and verse 9, And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. Uh, like Matthew, he had to be telling that they quickly were going back. They're like, we're all, we're all, let's go get these guys. Let's go tell them. And uh, I, I love the, the reaction. And Luke 24, verse 10 through 11, it says, that Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and, and the other women with them, who told them these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. This I love this. This is akin to when Peter was in jail, and they're praying all night for him to get the release. The angel brings him out. He's knocking on the door. The little girl goes to the gate to let him in, and she can't. She sees him out there, and she goes in and tells the other people, hey, Peter's right outside. They're like, what? That's silly. It's like, they didn't even believe their own prayer. So even these guys, they're telling them this, and they, they still don't believe. Again, they, they weren't having a waiting for the resurrection party. You know, they didn't have the matzo balls, the lamb, like, get, get the spread ready. Jesus is coming any moment now. Make sure, uh, I'm pretty sure he likes the broiled fish. Let's make sure we have that out here. Get us all ready to go. You know, any moment now. So, no, none of that. They weren't doing any of that. It, it just, it's an honest admission that the resurrection was the last thing on the agenda that day for their moment. They just didn't believe it. They just didn't believe that it was going to happen. There were some exceptions, though. As Luke says in Luke 24, 12, but Peter, Peter rose and ran to the tomb. John adds that he accompanied Peter. It was a foot race to run there. But I, but I love that it's Peter. I love that it's Peter. Because these last three days have probably been horrible for Peter. Not just that his Savior died, because he knows the last thing he did was deny the Savior. Almost looking at him eye to eye and saying, no, I don't know him. 
using curse words and everything. To just, no, I don't know him. That was his last memory of him. But now he's alive. So yes, it says Peter got up and he was running. I'm going to go see. I'm going to go see him. So like I said, it said John went with him and he said stooping and he ran into the tomb and stooping and looking in and saw the linen clothed by themselves. And he went home marveling at what had happened. So it's like that word marveling, like a, he's in amazement. He's in amazement. It's like, it's happened. It's happened. This is just crazy stuff. He's marveling about it. We'll get to that other encounters as we go down the line. But this morning, as we're thinking about this, this amazing stuff, I would like us to just take a second and examine a, a no-resurrection kind of Christianity. It's hard to believe, but there are, uh, and I would give them as best as respect as I can, so-called Christians that do not believe in the resurrection. It just amazes me that that would be true. But uh, I like, this is interesting, and hopefully you can see it well. But we got a graph here. This was uh, done in 2017 in England. And they were asking Christians, uh, they're believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and they had a percentage. It says down there, it's about 2,000, over 2,000 folks that were adults asking them about who they were, general public. Uh, is in red, orange is Christians, green is active Christians. So you can see that those that believe the Bible version of it, uh, uh, a large, almost just under just under sixty percent of the Christians believe the Bible version of it. It's still surprising to see that only about thirty percent of all Christians believe it. Uh, they have some where some believe, but not as in the Bible. So even then, that's kind of low. Uh, but then you get folks that just straight out don't believe. And you notice that the folks that put this graphic together even pointed an arrow at it that all Christians and active Christians, there's a percentage of active Christians that don't believe in the resurrection. And even then, it's like talk about allegedly about the 22% maybe or so of of, of all Christians that don't believe it. And, and it's just like, that's stunning. It's stunning. And I know it's a poll, and polls can be polls, you know, but it is what it is. But still, even if the numbers were half of what they're showing, that's still, that's sad. That's very sad. Who would be some of these folks? Well, uh, I actually got a quote from uh, uh, the president of the Union Theological Seminary from an interview from 2019, so just a couple years back, uh, in her <coughs> interview where she declared that she did not believe in the resurrection. Now keep in mind, uh, this was uh, a lady named Serene Jones, president of, the, of a theological seminary. Uh, so I, I read this in amazement. This is, and she, and this is her quote, I didn't put it up there. I'll have put part of her quote down the line. She says, when you look in the gospel, the stories are all over the place. Uh, see, there she has no idea of apologetics. Then she says this. She says, there's no resurrection story in Mark, which isn't even true. I'm like, did you even, like, I, when I was looking at that, have you even, like, read your Bible? Just like, but there it is. And she says, just an empty tomb. That is, that is not, that's still a resurrection. Still have something. It says, those who claim to know whether or not it happened are kidding themselves. Really? Okay. And then she says, the crucifixion is not something that God is orchestrating from upstairs. Again? Yeah. The Old Testament constantly talks about the whole event being orchestrated. Jesus talked about it being orchestrated. So it's just like, hello? Then she said, this persuasive idea of an an abusive godfather who sends his own kid to the cross so God can forgive people is nuts. And that's her opinion. Not a very good opinion, but that's her opinion. And it's just like, and she said, for me, the cross is not an, it is an enactment of our human hatred. So that's her idea. So part of this whole idea is just like, A, she is, 
for a president of a theological seminary. She has no idea about the Bible. And no idea what it says. No idea why it would say that. It's just sad. And then you can tell that she's got an agenda. Of course, full disclosure, Union Theological Seminary is very liberal, very pro progressive. But there it is. These are so-called Christians talking about this. To be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection is as a, one guy, a guy named Finn Sheridan, put this together. To, it's just like he, he talked about to, to be a Christian and not be such a contradiction as be saying vegetarians who eat meat, that'd be like that, or blind people who can see, or married people who are single. Single. One truth overrides the other. It just, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, and so it's the idea, so that's why I, I suggest, and I think I have uh, most of Christian truth and doctrine behind me when I say that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the hinge pin of Christianity. Yes. Yeah. And that's not an overstatement. It, it, it truly is, as, as we're going to see Paul talk about it, it, it rises and falls, really, truly, no pun intended, on that, on this resurrection. As scripture states, from Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, 14, he says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, meaning useless, and our, your faith is in vain, is useless. Jesus has been raised from the dead. This whole idea of believing in him is useless. Mm -hmm. Truly. Now, I want to finish her quote, because I didn't finish her quote. I want to add to it from her own words. And this I put on the overhead. So I add the last bit of it. It says, for me, the cross is an enactment of our human hatred. But what happens on Easter, so this is her, her idea, but what happens on Easter is the triumph of love in the midst of suffering. Isn't that reason for hope? And I was like, what? What are you saying? It, yeah. It's like, that is so silly and foolish. It's like, She's saying, what happens on Easter? Well, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, nothing happened on Easter then. If that's the way she's looking at it. And she's talking, about, isn't this a reason for hope? To which Paul, the apostle, answers right back from thousands of years, a couple thousand years ago, again, from 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19, he says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sin. Verse 18. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, ain't nobody else rising from the dead either. Right. Not even to go to heaven. There's nothing. In verse 19, it says, if in Christ, remember she was talking about this hope she had, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's it. That's like we were talking about when we were praying that, that, that movie you went to where it said heaven is for real. It just blew my mind that there was a pastor of the church who had a problem believing that heaven was for real. Because then in, the, in a sense Jesus was just a hope in this life for them. That was it. Just a good life coach. <laughs> Nothing. It's just so crazy in my mind. To be no resurrection Christians is to be pitied. Why? Here we go. Their Jesus is dead. Their Jesus is dead. Now keep in mind, our Jesus is alive. Amen. He's alive. And that means we're alive in him. These guys are to be pitied. Why? Because their Jesus is a liar. Their Jesus was a liar. Like, whoa, whoa, Robbie, why? Why would you say that? Well, because Jesus himself said that he was going to get crucified and he was raised from the dead. And if he didn't, Either he was greatly mistaken, deluded, or he was just lying. That would be it. So if he didn't rise from the dead, he, he would be a liar. 
But we know Jesus said the truth. That's why the resurrection, that, that's the capstone of everything. It's the, we can know that everything he said was true. It's the stamp. It's the, it, I like to say it's the signature on the check. Yeah. Look what I did. Signed by Jesus Christ. It's true. If there were, these guys would be pity because their Jesus did not take care of sin. That's all part of the resurrection. Because see, Jesus died on the cross. That, that did a lot. But again, it's only a truly innocent life that God would raise from the dead that would take care of sin. And so if God left him there, left him in the grave, it would mean that Jesus was a guilty human being and that our sin was not covered. So for these folks with no resurrection, guess what? They're still in sin. Their sins are not covered. They're still trying to navigate and figure out their way to try to earn their way to God. These guys, what's crazy, these guys will talk about grace and mercy and forgiveness and everything, but it's not there. You do not have it if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. It's, it's a non-thing. They're talking out their, you know what? Because it's just, that's, that's where they're at. They're fooling themselves. They're lying to themselves to believe that. And that, and that is pitiful. These no resurrection Christians are to be pitied because their Jesus has left them alone. If Jesus didn't, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we have no one to be fellowshipping with, no one to pray to. For these folks, if he didn't rise from the dead, there's no praying to Jesus, and yet they do, which is just silly. It's like, come on, be consistent. But because we know he's alive and living and at the right hand of the Father, and he says, pray in my name, where do we have fellowship with him, communion with him? These no resurrection Christians are to be pitied because their Jesus was proven to be cursed and defeated. Cursed and defeated. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, there's no victory. No victory, no triumph to be had. That's why I think they were talking about this triumph. It's like, what triumph? If you didn't rise from the dead, there's no triumphing nothing. Just defeat. And it shows, like I said, he was cursed and under sin. These no resurrection Christians are to be pitied because their Jesus has left them hopeless. This whole idea, they're like, when she was sitting there saying, oh yeah, this is going to be about love and all that. No, sorry, lady, you have no hope. You have zero hope. They can sit there and say, I have hope, but what is it? It's an empty hope. It's an empty hope. It has nothing. Nothing behind it. But that's the thing, for a resurrected hope, a resurrected Jesus Christ, we have a living hope. It's real. That's what changed the world. Those disciples, they like, man, this is, this is it. This is rad. And then the Holy Spirit filled them up. And 50 days later, they were ready to rock and roll. And they changed the world. They were, they were going after because they had a hope. That's why they were able to reach the slaves and, and everybody else, all the downtrodden. Because all the rich people had all their hope and their money and everything else. But everybody else, they had no hope. Especially in the pagan system, that they were, as far as they were concerned, they were born that way, going to stay that way. They had a, a caste system, too. This was there where they were at. Suddenly, somebody said, no, you want to be that way. There is a living redeemer, a guy who said he was God in the flesh, and he rose from the grave, and a lot of people saw it, and he's there for you, too, and he can save you. And they're like, whoa, that's hope. Amen. And they had hope. Mm -hmm. But these guys, yeah. If they have no a non-resurrected Christ, hey, if you're on the video, that's pitiful. That's pitiful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and as Paul said, you are to be pitied if that's the truth. But I think there's tons of evidence to show us that it, it is true. A lot of evidence. A lot of decent, and it's circumstantial evidence, but it's good evidence. 
to show that the story of the resurrection is true, believable, and dependable. And that's exciting stuff. So this morning, we're, we're going to have communion. And I was thinking about this, especially in, in light of this idea, is just like when Jesus is there, he says, my body is about to be broken for you. I am about ready to bleed for you. He said what he was going to do. And that's the thing, the resurrection proved that he did it. Proved that he did it. That's why I think, you know, it's just like the, the resurrection is a key part of salvation. That's why I read to you the gospel that Paul, he said, this is the gospel that Christ was, was crucified and rose again on the third day. That's the gospel. Many of you are familiar with this gospel verse. Romans 10, 9. It says, if you confess with your mouth and believe that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, what? That God left Jesus in the grave? No. That Jesus was stolen? No. So it said, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. That's the salvation message. It <laughs> comes down to it again. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. There is no such thing as salvation. Just death. That's why when we celebrate communion today, we're celebrating a living Savior. So, uh, Charlie, go ahead and uh, key some music, and I'll pass out to the community.